Well, welcome once again to Graceway Baptist Church, our Sunday school hour. This is the lesson that we're going to present on uh, November the 5th, 2023. And uh, we are coming into the last chapter of the book of Galatians. So go ahead and take your Bible and turn to Galatians chapter 6. And we will start in verse 1 in uh, just a moment. Our theme this month is going to be uh, picking up on what Paul said about walking or living in the Spirit. And uh, you read through this book and you notice, you know, the conflict and then you notice the correction, you know, about the gospel. And then you come to this point where you see the practical aspect of just walking in the Spirit cures everything that he's had to uh, deal with before. And there's where our problem is. We don't really walk in the Spirit. And that means living in the Spirit. It's not just an experience or a feeling or something like that. I remember um, hanging around some uh, Christian guys that were in the military in 1973 particularly. And that's about the time when the charismatic movement just kind of exploded on the scene. And there was a full gospel business men's fellowship international with Demas Shakarian and different people like that. And a lot of uh, people that are kind of established in the word faith movement now uh, were coming, you know, of age then. And there were different people. I won't name them all. Probably couldn't remember them anyway. But the idea was that you can be saved, but you don't really have the Holy Spirit until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in tongues and other things like that. And so people were seeking something that was going to be a, you know, a pow, got it now. And uh, instead of realizing that in Christ you are complete, the Bible says, you're complete in Him, lacking nothing. Uh, the Bible says that we have all things that pertain to life and godliness, okay? Use your concordance if you need to, if you want to reference those. Because uh, it also says in the book of Romans in the 8th chapter that if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, you don't belong to the Lord. The Holy Spirit comes at salvation in full measure to indwell us and indwell us permanently. And at that point, we are baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit of God, and we are also gifted by the Holy Spirit, and we always have Him. The key is going to be whether we are yielded to Him or not. Because the Bible does say, written to people who are indwelt by the Spirit, that we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit or quench the Holy Spirit. Okay, so keep in mind, we can do those things and he doesn't leave, but he would be grieved or quenched. In other words, his power would not be in full operation and full display in our lives. And so uh, Paul says to the Galatians here, the remedy is found in walking or living in the Spirit. Okay, so it's not an optional thing. It's uh, also not a personal, private experience that nobody can ever know or, you know, have anything to do with. This is something available to all of the body of Christ. It's not just a feeling and it's not just something that is for me and me alone. A lot of people kind of give you that idea. Uh, the Holy Spirit makes us like Jesus and empowers us to uh, minister to others. Think about Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man, that would be Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's what we will look like if we are truly walking in the Spirit or under the control of the Holy Spirit. It, it makes us look like Jesus. It makes us do what Jesus did, to serve and to give, as we see in that passage in Mark. So let's look at chapter 6, verse 1 of the book of Galatians. Uh, very first word clues us in. This is not to lost people. This is to the church. 
This is to Christians. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, that's another term for walking in the Spirit, okay, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Now, some of that seems a little bit confusing. We'll uh, untangle that as we go through that, hopefully. And uh, let's take point number one and say this, walking in the Spirit, and the idea there is restoration. Restoration. Think about the Holy Spirit's job. Uh, the Bible says things like, um, the natural mind cannot, uh, man cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they are spiritually discerned. And so we know that the Holy Spirit teaches us, Jesus told us, that when he would leave, he would send another helper, uh, not another of a different kind, but another of the same kind. God is going to come and indwell us. Never think of the Holy Spirit as an it. The Holy Spirit is God, fully God. And he's not third string God or anything, co-equal with the Father and the Son. And so the Spirit comes to indwell us. And the Bible says... Jesus says, uh, same thing, He will guide us into all truth. Guide us into truth. You know what that means? The Holy Spirit is, um, I think it was John MacArthur who put it this way, your resident truth teacher. How do you understand the Word of God? Because of the Holy Spirit. How do you live the Word of God and apply it to your life? Because of the Spirit of God. How do you teach others? By the Spirit of God. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so to walk in the Spirit is to be conformed to the image of His Son, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the work of the Spirit. He convicts us of sin, He teaches us, He leads us into righteousness, gives us an understanding of the Word of God, and uh, that is what makes us like Christ. So when we are walking in the Spirit, we want to do what Jesus did in the way that uh, Jesus did it. And think about it, it's all about restoration. Restoration. The whole thing that we find in the gospel is God wanting to restore fallen humanity that had inherited Adam's sin nature and were rebels against God. So God is the one who seeks. God is the one who saves. God is the one who redeems and restores. And the Holy Spirit is his agent on earth for doing that. Convicting of sin, presenting Jesus Christ, giving understanding of the gospel, and uh, faith to believe the gospel. Think about all of that. So, doesn't it make sense that when Paul talks about walking in the Spirit, he's going to talk to believers, because believers don't, pardon me, unbelievers don't have the Holy Spirit. Only believers do. And so we're dealing with fallen creatures. Even our fellow believers are like us. They have a sin nature. They can fall into sin. So if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, and again that means who are walking in the Spirit, are going to have a compulsion to do something, to restore such a one. In other words, the more you become like Jesus and the more the Holy Spirit conforms you, to the image of Christ, the more concerned you're going to be about the mission of Jesus, and that is to restore people unto the Lord. Now, it may be through witnessing to a lost person. It may be in praying for a lost person. It may be in your concern for a lost person or world missions or anything like that. That's the heart of God, and that's how you know the first step in knowing 
that you are walking in the spirit, that you are a spiritual person. You're concerned about what is on the heart of God. Restoration of sinners to their Lord. And then we uh, think about the fact that sometimes even believers stray. It wasn't a lost goat that the shepherd went after. It was a lost sheep. He belonged in the fold, but he had strayed. So consider this. Whenever you think about a brother or sister in the Lord that is strayed away from the Lord, if you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to be ambivalent or laissez-faire about that. Oh, that's their business. No big deal. It doesn't affect me. You're going to care about that. And if you are walking in the Spirit, you're going to be involved in their restoration. Now, Paul didn't tell us how. I mean, you may be the one that goes to them and says, Look, I'm worried about you. I'm concerned about you. I love you and I'm begging you to get right with God. That could be. But it also may be that you're concerned about them and your part is to pray for them and to pray for God, to send someone into their life and to give them understanding and to give them a heart that would be willing to obey and a, a heart of repentance so that they'll get right with God. It may be some other kind of ministry. I don't know. But the key is we're going to be involved in that. We're going to care in that. So brethren, again, addressed to all believers who are spiritual or walking in the Spirit, as it says back in chapter 5, verse 16. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, we're supposed to do this for those who are overtaken. That's an interesting word because all of us sin and all of us need restoration every day. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. Every day we should be confessing our sins and uh, experiencing the cleansing from that sin that comes to those whose sins have been paid for by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to live in that and to walk in that and to desire that for other people. But the word overtaken here is not talking about a will, willful, stubborn, rebellious type sin. I'm going to do it no matter what anybody says or thinks or anything like that. This is overtaken means I want you to think about a football game and think about when somebody gets tackled from behind. They don't even see it coming. Somebody comes and they catch up with them and they tackle them and they go down, tackled from behind. That's what overtaken means. It's the idea, literally it means a false step. You're walking, maybe at night, and you're walking in your neighborhood, and you don't see the part of the sidewalk where the concrete is raised up, or maybe has tree roots growing underneath it, and it's kind of crumbled and all of that, and you trip over that. that that's the idea. I was coming down from cleaning my gutters one time, and I was stepping down the ladder, and I thought I was at the last step, and I wasn't. You know what happened? Man, I fell flat on my back on concrete. Fortunately, it uh, didn't hurt me or anything like that. Uh, you know you're in good shape when the first thing you do is look to see if anybody was watching, right? Uh, that's what is known as or called a false step or being overtaken like that. You didn't intend to. You didn't plan for it. You weren't looking for it. It just kind of caught up with you. It happens sometimes. Sometimes we find ourselves getting angry or some of the works of the flesh that are listed in Galatians 5, and we never intended for that to happen. It wasn't like we set out for it or we premeditated it or we planned for it or anything like that. And when we find another brother or sister that is like that, they've messed up, they've tripped up, they've fallen, then... Uh, we are to restore them. Now notice too that this is a, let's call it a visible sin where you have firsthand knowledge. This isn't acting on, I just sense that they're out. You don't know that. Uh, somebody told me, and boy, they always tell the truth, but you don't hear both sides of the story. So you've got to be careful about this. This is about first-hand knowledge. You've actually seen them tripped up. You've actually seen them mess up. You have first-hand knowledge or they've told you about it and uh, you act on what you actually know instead of rumor or assumption. 
and you follow the steps in Matthew chapter 18 to do this. You don't go blabbing about it to everybody. Oh, I've got a prayer request and, and then start exposing everybody's dirty laundry or something. We don't want to do that. Matthew 18 says you go to your brother or sister privately and you keep it that way. And if they repent, then you've gained a brother. No one else needs to hear about it and you keep your mouth shut. We don't want to embarrass them. We don't want to make it difficult for them. We don't want to put a stumbling block in their way. It's settled and it is done. We're not going to slander. We're not going to gossip. We're not going to, I think you probably need to know. We're not going to play that game. We're going to follow what it says. That's step one. And then the Bible says, if he will not hear you, then take a couple of witnesses with you so that everything is established. And again, the purpose in taking the witnesses is that they, number one, can report what happened just in case the uh, sinning brother wants to distort and maybe lie and mischaracterize what you did. You've got witnesses there that have seen it. But the other thing that they might do is while you're in the midst of telling this person where they've sinned, the witness may go, hey, hold on a minute. Uh, I seem to remember you doing the exact same thing or the way you are dealing with this is harsh and, and cruel and, and vengeful sounding and very immature. So they may rebuke you too. So you sure you want to do this? Step number three would be to inform the church. That's when you tell the church leaders. Not at step one, not at step two, but at step three. And if the church leadership, like the elders, for example, if they then say, yeah, yeah, you're right, this needs to be dealt with, then they have a word that they are to say to uh, the sinning brother. And if they won't hear the church, Jesus said, then that's when you excommunicate them. That's when you uh, treat them differently as a tax collector, Jesus said. But the whole idea in here is not to get revenge, not to put somebody out of the church, not to do anything like, not to hurt them, not to get back at them, not to make them pay, quote unquote. This is what the whole thing is the idea of restoring them. You who are spiritual, restore such a one. Restore. Are we leaving the door open for them? Are we leaving the porch light on for them? Are we leaving the welcome sign out for them? Because our goal is to try to get this right. That ought to be the heart of the church. And the church is not a building or an institution. The church is you as a child of God. So I ask you, is that your heart? Number two, walking in the spirit also, Paul says, is gentleness. In a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. It's not arrogant. It's not in a spirit of superiority. I don't see how a Christian could ever do that. You call yourself a Christian. I could never do that. That's not the way we do it. Gentle, gentle, not angry, not mean, not vengeful, not, uh, not an arrogant way or anything like that. Gentle and considering ourselves, not in anger, rejection, or maybe the word uh, harshness, comes to mind here and understand that gentleness is a part of the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5 verse 23 it's not the kind of thing that's always yelling mean and uh, pushing people away and putting them in their place and they just need to hear this that's not the fruit of the spirit that sounds a whole lot more like the work of the flesh doesn't it okay in the spirit of gentleness the spirit of gentleness wants to see repentance, restoration, and reconciliation. And the person in sin is treated, listen to this, as a brother, not an enemy. Okay, as a brother, not an enemy. And sometimes we get those things all mixed up, don't we? And that's found in 2 Thessalonians 3.15. We are to admonish him as a brother and not count him as an enemy. That would solve a lot of problems, wouldn't it? Number three, walking in the Spirit is not this arrogant standing over people, judging them and putting them in their place and forcing them. 
No, it's about servanthood. Do you like that word? Your flesh won't. It says, in the context of restoring a fallen brother, we are to bear one another's burdens. Sometimes people need some help up. Sometimes when they fall and they bang up their knee, they can't get up. They need some help getting up. They need somebody to, uh, maybe they're, they have a backpack on or something like that. They need somebody to say, here, let me take that and let me carry it for you and let me help you get to the car and get home so we can uh, clean that up. Or maybe it's, you know, take you to the ER or something like that. That's the spirit that we're supposed to have. How may I help you? How can I help you get things straightened out? How can I help you through the results of your sin? Because sin always has bad results, doesn't it? It brings pleasure for a season, but afterward, uh, it's not so much. It's painful when we go through that. And so we've got to help people with their problems, with their pain as much as we can, with their burdens, as Paul says. And the idea here is somebody that is carrying a heavy load. I want you to think about maybe in the military, every soldier has their, oh, let's say, machine gun and a pistol, and they also have a, a backpack on, and that's part of their uniform. But let's say that uh, here's a guy over here, and he's been told, go over there and pick up that, whatever it might be, and it's extremely heavy, and you, while you're carrying all your own stuff, you go over and you help him. You pick him, you help him carry the water or whatever it is they are getting or doing. And so we share the load and we help each other with that. Now, this word, because of the context here, is not just saying whenever we have a dinner at the church, like we're going to have on the, I believe it's the 19th, our Thanksgiving dinner, this is not so much about helping people pick up chairs or pick up tables. This is talking about the burden. We bear the burden of their life that came about because of their sin. Understand that. This is getting our hands dirty with other people. This is being a friend to them, being kind to them, helping them when they are bearing the consequences of what they themselves have caused by their sin. That's a little bit different, isn't it? And so we have this idea of servanthood, okay? And uh, you know what keeps you from being a servant? Verse 3, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You know, there's some people that just think they're too good to help anybody else. They are too pure to help anybody else. They are too goody two-shoes and holy and sanctimonious to help anybody else. We should never think of ourselves like that because we could be the next one down. We could be the next one to fall. We could be the next one to stumble and trip up and to hurt ourselves because of that sin. So we need to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Okay? Um, I think that's pretty much what we... Oh, fulfill the law of Christ, which is, of course... The law of love. A new commandment, Jesus said, I give to you that you should love one another and by the love we have for one another, others will know that we're Christ's disciples, right? And so maybe in this world, the reason we don't have more impact is we don't love enough and we think we do because we have warm, fuzzy feelings toward other people, but we don't really get involved in helping them pick up the pieces of their life bear the burden of the consequences of sin and doing it in a spirit of gentleness because we're walking in the Spirit and because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we love our brothers and sisters even when they are a mess. So the law of Christ is the law of love. And all of this is done in grace, the undeserved favor that comes from God, and in humility because there's no place for arrogance, superiority, or even scorekeeping. This isn't a game where we compare what we've done and what we haven't done and, and rank ourselves because of that. In other words, you compare yourself and your efforts to Christ, not other people, and that'll set you straight and keep you humble all the time, won't it? Number four, as we finish up here, walking in the Spirit is exemplary. You know, we've kind of lost the idea of walking and living in a way 
to where we can be an example to other people. The spirit of our age right now is, I don't care what other people think. Well, I've got to be me and I've got to do what I'm supposed to do. Well, the only thing we have to do is to be obedient and submissive to Christ. But we are to help one another and we're also to be a good example to others who are watching us, who are following uh, along behind us. But let each one examine his own work. Okay, we are so busy examining everybody else. No, examine his own work and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and uh, not in another. In other words, we're not playing the comparison game. Well, I'm better than you, and at least I didn't do what you did in the way that you did it. It's not that kind of a game. For each one shall bear his own load. Well, I thought we were to bear one another's burdens. There are some things you have to bear yourself. There are some things that are not meant for everybody to know or to be involved in. A friend of mine that <clears throat> teaches a lot on prayers he said, sometimes the reason we don't get the support we want in prayer is because we're asking the body to pray for things they can't relate to or know anything about. In other words, you may have a sin problem in your life and the whole church would just kind of go, well, what does that have to do with us? And sometimes that's a good question. What you really need to do in that case, there are some sins you need to just take to God and to God alone. The whole church doesn't need to know about every wicked thought or action or anything you've done. In fact, it might stumble some people uh, to do that. Keep it between you and God alone. Then there's another type of prayer to where you need to get two or three friends that are close to you, people that love you, and you need to say, I've got this burden and I need to share it with somebody. I need some help and I need some prayer support. And they know you, they love you, they care about you. They may not even know the situation. And so they covenant together with you to pray. And so we have what we call closet praying between you and God alone. Companion praying when you take it to two or three people that have some reason to be involved in your life. And then there is corporate praying. Some sin and some situations affect the entire body and the ministry of the church. And those are the ones that we should bring before other people. But the idea here is there are just some loads we have to carry by ourselves, And there are just some burdens that we have to bear and we bear it alone with the help, of course, and the attention of the Lord like a soldier bears his backpack or knapsack by himself. And so not everything... Not everything is everybody else's business or responsibility. Some things you just have to carry and uh, walk through those valleys yourself, knowing that you're never alone and the Lord always gives you the strength. So be wise and be discerning on all of that. And uh, think about how the Bible talks about we are to examine our own work. We're to look at our own lives. So I would ask you as we uh, come to the conclusion here, what do you do with your resources? And what do you do with your opportunities? What do I mean by that? Well, you have health. I pray you do anyway. What are you doing with it? Why should God grant us health if all we're going to do is sit and watch TV like we would if we were sick or an invalid? But if we're going to use our health and the strength that God gives us to be a blessing to other people, to share the gospel, to share the word of God, to help restore people who have fallen, well, now there's a reason for us to be healthy until the Lord is ready to take us home, right? What do you do with your time? Why should God give you another day if you're just going to waste it selfishly? Why should he give you uh, more time to live if you're not going to use it for his glory and for the well-being of other people. What about your plans? You know, we have dreams and we have plans. And I don't think there's anything wrong with dreaming. I don't think there's anything wrong with planning. But why should God grant that if you're just going to use it for yourself? You don't want to share it with anybody. You don't want to involve anybody else in it. It's just about you and what you want to do. So why should he bless you 
if you're going to do anything else. So we need to examine ourselves sometimes because we're not all that we think we are. We're not exactly what we would proclaim to be, but boy, can we sure look down our nose at other people. So have you been willing to use these things for ministry? Ministry means servanthood, by the way. And then we're to do it with a rejoicing spirit, not a gloating spirit, and not a spirit of comparison, helping somebody carry something. Well, I can't believe you have this burden. You know you wouldn't have this burden if you were right with God like me, and I overcame this along. I mean, that doesn't help anybody. Now, if they ask, then you can tell them, but uh, don't do that. So you bear your own load, and that means take responsibility for your own life, and make sure that you, are, you actually are walking in the Spirit before you get arrogant and conceited and judgmental about everybody else. Take care of yourself. This is the idea that Jesus said, when you've got a log in your eye, don't try to take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's what, that's, what this is meaning. And it means we ought to be willing to help one another uh, in the things that we are going through in life because life is hard. We are sinners. We mess up, and a lot of times we didn't even intend to mess up. And we're fully willing to repent. We just need a little help to get going again. So the conclusion is that walking in the Spirit and having the fruit of the Spirit is more than just some weirdo experience that we have. And uh, it's more than just being happy or feeling good. And it enables us to be servants to help fellow believers, and to be Christ-like in practical ways. So how practical is your life? How practical is your Christianity? Does it really honor and glorify the Lord? Does it really keep you straight? And does it really cause you to reach out and help other people like the Good Samaritan did to the man who was beaten up by the robbers? That would be a Another example of being overtaken by a sin. He didn't ask for that. He didn't look for that. He wasn't trying to get that to happen. They came upon him. And what did the good Samaritan do? He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. Tended to the man's wounds. Put him on his own animal so that he had to walk. Took him to the inn. Gave him the medical treatment that he needed. And then paid for all of it, didn't he? And Jesus said, so... Who's the, who's the neighbor, the Jew or the Samaritan? And of course, it's the Samaritan. So we need to have that servant's heart that comes from the Lord Jesus himself because he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, how many problems would that solve? How many relationships would that heal? How different would it be if we really, really believed that and then we were diligent to apply it? And there's the challenge. We're not to be hearers of the word only. We're to be doers of the word. So do it and do it with diligence and do it for the glory of God and the good of other people. Love the Lord with all you've got and love your neighbor as well as you love yourself. Right? So thank you for your time. And thank you for being with us. We'll look forward to seeing you for next week's lesson as we continue in this little series here out of Galatians on walking in the Spirit. May the Lord help us all to do that. Thank you.